Yes, thank you very much. I'm John Mitchell from ALMAP, and I wanted to pick up on a point that Sarah, and in fact, uh, Sarah made it, and, and a couple of other people on the panel also made it, and it's about the bureaucratization of humanitarian aid and, and the kind of advance of corporate culture. And as you were speaking, I, it, I was thinking about a book that I read when I first started in this business, and it was called, it was called Warrior Without Weapons. And it's a book by Marcel Junot, who was an old ICRC doctor. And I think he wrote this in the, in the 1950s. And he spoke about something called the spirit of the thing, which was a, a, a description of uh, the, 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 the values and the motivation which um, drove him to work in the humanitarian aid business. And listening to Sarah talking about the um, development of a corporate culture and administration and so on, I, I, I got the sense that you may have been saying that that kind of spirit was beginning to fade slightly. And it made me wonder where, where in the humanitarian world now you would see that spirit, or you should see that spirit um, sort of burning, I suppose. And it made me think about the leaders that we have in the humanitarian world today. And there have been some great ones in the past, Sergio de Mello and Ian Egland and so on and so forth. And I wonder if the panelists felt that that kind of leader um, was still with us, or are we seeing a different kind of leader that embodies the values of a corporate culture instead? Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. That was a great uh, question and point. Uh, can we now go to the lady here? Thank you. Palladium International Development. And I also have a question about um, this growth of organizations and how they become too big. Um, I know that um, these emergency situations are very um, unpredictable, and um, I would like to ask you, um, how um, can an organization prepare? Is it possible to prepare at all? And um, would maybe a bigger size um, help in that respect? Um, where is the right balance here? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Mark Galloway, Director of the International Broadcasting Trust. I, I want to change the subject slightly and talk about the way that the media covers aid. Uh, there seems to be very little public understanding of how aid works. Do, do you find that frustrating? Do you have any thoughts about how the media could, could actually help? Do you think that we as a sector are doing, thinking enough about communication? It seems ironic that you said in some ways communications are <laughs> dominant, but are we thinking enough about how to engage the public? Is it important that there is public understanding? Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Sarah, maybe you, would you like to um, address certainly the, the first question? First question. Yeah. Yes. That was a very good question. It's something I ask myself sometimes, you know, where, where, where do we see that spirit burning, but also how can we make sure that that spirit continues to be, you know, all across? the humanitarian sector. Um, and I would say that, yes, that, that spirit is still there. And, and I see that a lot in actually frontline staff, regardless of organization they work with. There is a very strong difference between, you know, colleagues that work um, on the ground and, you know, the headquarters. And that tension is there between, you know, a lot of the staff deployed in the field and living this day to day. And, you know, some of those were worried about the corporate side of the business. And in fact, I think some of the biggest challenges and, you know, the deepest discussions happens between, happen between, you know, the staff at the, at, the, at the front of the response and their own headquarters. But I would say in some of the smaller organizations, definitely the more local ones, the diaspora ones, that's where it burns more, maybe because they're fresher, maybe because, because they haven't gone through that process of bureaucratization yet, and hopefully they can learn from the experience of others and not go there before it's too late, but I think that that's where it is. Um, and it, in, it is also in, you know, colleagues that come from a different tradition that are starting to become um, more, um, if you want, established in, uh, um, in, in the humanitarian world. They're learning more and more, they're expanding um, their knowledge and understanding of how they're responding. I'm thinking of a number of the organizations that have started to operate in Syria or you know, in other, in other contexts where you know, the traditional Western organizations are less present. And we see you know, their leadership is less celebrated, is less public, is less, um, if you want, in, you know, 
either in the media or even in the knowledge, the overall knowledge of the sector. But over the last two, three years in, you know, in particular, I think having as a team in, in HPG done more work on this crisis, we've, we've met a large number of these you know, colleagues who are leading their or organizations through a, through a phase that hopefully can also inspire and reinvigorate you know, and all of us. I mean, some of the, the Syria diaspora organizations, for instance, that we have profiled, you know, this, around this very table in, in HPG, I think are some of those that um, are, sh are, are also challenging the traditional system and you know, demanding a change that is, you know, now overdue. Um, but I don't know if you want me to, to address, I think there was a related yes, question yeah. about how you balance yeah. that. You know, it, it is about the priorities you set um, from the top. Uh, he, he, yes, your trustees may want you to grow, but you, uh, you know, as a chief executive, uh, in a way, you are involved in choosing your trustees as well. You know, it depends on who you choose. If your boards are, you know, filled with uh, um, people from the corporate sector for whom, you know, success equals growth of business and, you know, growth of revenues, then, of course, they're going to judge you that way. But it depends on you know, who you entrust the governance of your organization into and uh, you know, how you deal with them, how you engage with them. Uh, you can set the boundaries for your organization, of course. You can decide that uh, you know, you'll be charged by quality and not by, by growth of, uh, of revenues. Um, but you need to you know, then make sure that you recruit the staff that think alike, you know, they're motivated by the same passion, and, you know, you develop a governance system that is in tune with the, with the values of your organizations. I think, you know, there are examples of organizations that have done that in our sector, um, and one can learn, but unfortunately they're the minority rather than the majority today. Th thanks very much, Sarah. And I know that uh, Al Khudra wants to uh, come yeah. in, but first, uh, yeah, Katie, um, yeah. it, it, you, you wanted to say something. Um, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on um, like how we keep the, the spirit of humanitarianism burning and also about leadership. Like where are the, the good leaders yeah. today? Yeah, I also <laughs> think it was a really good question. And we've mm. had this discussion, you know, a lot and it's coming up a lot and it's just the fact that we have next year this thing called the World Humanitarian Summit mm. for me is a in, in a lot of the the humanitarian in me is scared rigid at this because it is the final step into the mainstream into the world of acceptability or you're part of the system if you have a world summit or you're part of the political system on the other hand, of course, there are lots of good things about that, the recognition, uh, the, 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 you know, but we do still, when we talk about humanitarian leaders, we talk about people who were thriving 20, 30 years ago, some of whom are no longer with us. Who are the people of the future? Well, probably al is is best, best place to tell us because they won't be here. They will be somewhere else. And I think... You know, that's, that's great, and they need to be encouraged, and that needs to be encouraged on a local level, a national level. Uh, that spirit is very much alive. Anyone who's worked with the Red Cross movement will know that, you know, there are volunteers everywhere working in terrible circumstances, but there are for other organisations too. So it is absolutely still there, but I think the, the expectation is massive now. You know, in the day... You did what you could with what you had. Nobody really knew much about it because you couldn't get hold of anybody. There was certainly no 24-7 scrutiny of everything you were doing and everything that was going on. And again, huge good reasons for that. And we're all happy to be more transparent and accountable. At the same time, that brings a, 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 an inevitable, a, a complete change in the way that we're looked at and the way that we look at ourselves. We're, we're now a business when we were kind of a, a gifted amateurs club. And those are both e extremes, but there's, there's some truth in that. Now, do we want to go back to that? I don't think we have the option. I don't think we can go back. Every organization or every organism grows and bureaucratizes as it grows. That's almost one of the rules, laws of nature, I think. You know, so we are now part of, a, part of the establishment. 
how are we going to deal with that and keep a spirit going which is if you like the absolute antipathy of establishment because it's simply it's not about doing what we should be doing to grow or doing what is easy to do or doing what's going to look good on your cv it is by definition doing what actually most people are going to hate you for doing or people are going to you know uh, criticize you for doing or, or bring all kinds of problems to bear I don't think we've got a problem keeping that spirit alive because it's everywhere. But getting those inspirational individuals, finding the, you know, getting that kind of platform, I think, is the, the next maybe social media or whatever it is challenge. And I don't think we, we do enough of that. We do tend to rely, you know, on a bit, you know, the old school still. So we've got a ways to go on how to, to get there, I think, from that point of view. You wanted to say something about this? Uh, you, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Mitch, uh, you know, Michelle, about your question. I think your question is very critical because for me, leadership is a key issue. And leadership is about inspiration. Leadership is about courage. Leadership is about taking risk. Yeah. But leadership is about taking the blame. Yeah. Also, it's not about pushing the blame to the others. And all this about leadership. Who inspire me? Yes, Jan, people like Jan England inspire me. But I just want to ask a critical question. This country has been given three opportunities to appoint the relief coordinator. Have they inspired you? Question, they, they did not inspire me. And I said that publicly. And I felt that this country have lost golden opportunity of shaping and making the humanitarian response across the globe and have lost that opportunity. Look at the recent debate about the appointment of the, of the current humanitarian coordinator. It was, <coughs> and the people, not the one, but the one before that, uh, the nomination. It was just a scandal for me. And, and this, is, this is real issue that people do not talk about it. If you are talking about people who are inspire you in the humanitarian, in every, do you, if you, I give you one number of two examples. I personally have been inspired by many people when I go to the field. Mm. After the 2007 elections, the crisis happened in, 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 uh, um, Ken in Kenya. Kenya. Abbas <laughs> Gurley, do you know Abbas? He is, he is uh, the head leading the Red Cross, Red Cross, uh, Kenyan Red Cross. He came up. He was a source of inspiration because he put himself to the risk. He walked out, but he went beyond the humanitarian sphere and he managed, through his action, managed to bring the Kenyan back as a nation. Mm -hmm. he, the, that is why I'm saying that the humanitarian response should be used as a vehicle to achieve the Millennium Development Goals in the past and the Sustainable Development Goals in the past. If we are not using that, and if somebody is not inspiring us to that level, then it is a question. There are many people who inspire me. There is one called Dr. Zubair, Dr. Zuhair. He used to be a, a, a medical doctor who put himself whenever the outbreak of a diseases. He is the first one. He will not negotiate his salary. He's today in Mogadishu responding to the people. He inspired me. And there are many stories that who, who could inspire that. But there are there is a group of CEOs who are <coughs> following a, a, a target of money. And there's a group of humanitarianism who want to accomplish a target. This is one fight. And then there's a politicians who want to nominate people who have no clue of what is humanitarianism. <laughs> no clue what is humanitarianism. And they want to put them in the front lines. Do you want that is going to reform the humanitarian sector? <coughs> I think that is the question that we need to ask. And we must answer this question. And everyone in the humanitarian business, that uh, Bill Gates, he inspired me. He really inspired me, not only about my, he inspired me that he put all his wealth. Look at the Amir, the, the, the Saudi Amir, he put 32 billion. He put it, he said, I have been inspired by Bill Gates. What is Bill Gates is doing right now? He's doing the under uh, uh, mortality, infant mortality, under five mortality. He's trying to tackle it. Is that not inspiration? It is an inspiration. Thank you very, very much. And uh, Charlie, I know you also wanted to say something about this, but can you also address the question about media and whether the media is getting it wrong in terms of trying to explain to the public about uh, humanitarian work? Yeah, well, so 
I think just on that point about the bureaucratisation, I think um, efficiency obviously is a very laudable aim in itself. But I think if, if, from what I've seen, if efficiency becomes the sort of end goal in itself and you lose sight of actually the reasons why you're doing things, uh, the core values of humanitarian work, I think, that, I think that, that's where the problem comes in. And I've been in situations where I've felt like I've been asked to do things uh, particularly related to prisons and report writing, and I've just sort of thought, well, am I just ticking a sort of an efficiency box or am I just submitting a number of reports so as uh, someone at headquarters is satisfied that we have this, this amount of reports coming in this year from this field office. So I think that, you know, that efficiency should never become an end in itself. The end should always be these amazing principles which, which underline and inform humanitarian work. And in terms of inspiration, I think that inspirational figures, it's, for me in humanitarian work, it's always been the, ins the inspirational figures are the people who can best embody uh, the ideals of humanitarian work. And the people I've worked with, maybe personally they haven't been incredibly impressive, but everything they've done has been an embodiment of these ideals. And that I've, that's always the thing which I've found uh, incredibly uh, impressive and inspiring. And it's actually sort of the, sort of the quieter type who, who you sort of really get that sense of inspiration from. Um, and I think that one thing on the spirit, I always found the humanitarian spirit, uh, the sort of the broader sense of it, was most alive in places where you don't have the internet. Um, because in some offices, if everyone has the internet in the evening, instead of kind of hanging out together or cooking together or talking about your day, everyone's on Skype. Uh, and I think that was, it's, you know, I'd noticed that from starting, that it was kind of a bit of a killer, actually, for spirit, because people would spend most of their time talking to their families on Skype and not actually not being present in the moment. And that could be at work, and that could be, you know, so they're sort of 30% in wherever their home is, and then 70% in, in the office, and it's not, you need to be fully present to, um, to embody that. And just on, on personalities, I think the use of political figures as sort of frontispieces for humanitarian organizations, let's take David Miliband, I think the conflation of politics and humanitarian ends, you know, he is a perfect example, is, is a very, you know, he's obviously a very impressive person, and, and, and he's very qualified to do the job, but... I don't think it's a particularly good look for someone who's been foreign secretary in a particular administration, which did particular things, to, to be to, to be sort of in that role. I think a lot of people will say, oh, "Hang on a minute, isn't wasn't he foreign secretary in that government?" Um, and I think that goes to the media question that if that's if that's what we're getting from the media, if that's what people are getting, that oh, you can go seamlessly from being someone who's politically very active to being someone who's head of a humanitarian organisation. What, what does that tell us about it? And I think in terms of, particularly since sort of 2001, 9-11 onwards, the conflation of achieving political goals through developmental sort of um, means, you know, whether it's counterinsurgency, whatever it is, suddenly the lines between humanitarian work and um, politics have become slightly blurred. So, you know, if you take Afghanistan, for example, they had these things called provincial reconstruction teams, which were doing develop things which were broadly in line with development, um, and yet they were soldiers, and I think that that's a really big perception issue because if someone comes into your village and starts building a school, but they've got a gun, uh, that's fine until someone tries to kill them and then there's a firefight and suddenly that person who's come into your village to build a, a school is, is a soldier, and particularly he's involved in the conflict. So then the perception of, hum of sort of development becomes very skewed in other people's minds. And I think actually in, in that sort of host, you know, here, I know that people are very confused as to what is development to further political aims, or is it um, is it something else? And with the Red Cross, I've had the, the ICRC, the luxury of actually being in a in a, a, a slightly you're sort of on, on your own. I think the ICRC occupy a very unique place in the world of, of humanitarian work, not necessarily development. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of my friends. Whenever I say how oh, I work for the Red Cross, they with the ICRC, they say, oh, I didn't know you're a doctor. <laughs> and so I'm I'm not. <laughs> I'm not, I'm actually an interpreter in Afghanistan, and they say, oh, I didn't know you speak Arabic. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the sort of the double question you get. Um, so yes, it is. I mean, I, I personally think that as long as, as, long as these, these organizations are doing the amazing things in, in the countries in which they're working, I think that for me is more important, actually. I think that's the most important thing. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, and I think it goes back to the bureaucratization thing, actually getting a little bit more of the sort of maverick nature. So if you have to do something, Instead of saying, I mean, a little bit what Imran was saying, instead of saying, oh, well, I can't do that because I've got this rule or I've got that, you just go, let's find a way to do it. 
Um, and I think that's, that's a really important sort of spirit to go back to, yes. that, that this sort of total can-do attitude and almost saying the rules and regulations, okay, let's just try and achieve what we set out to achieve. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. Th thanks very much. Um, we'll have a few more questions. Uh, there's uh, a gentleman here and then a lady back there, and I've also got uh, some from the online audience, which uh, I'll ask. But should we start with you, please? Yeah. Hi, I'm Tee Biswas, and I'm just a student um, soon to be at the University of Cambridge. Um, my question is, it cropped up across the panel, and you're talking about recruiting the right staff, um, particularly from Western countries and developed world, and you want to recruit the right staff. And a article in the Wall Street Journal a few days ago mentioned an internship with the UN where a gentleman had to camp outside uh, to have, an, have his expenses met. And whilst I appreciate, in the grand scheme of things, that isn't a, a tangible uh, battle against some of the things you are doing, what it does show is these organisations aren't accessible for people from poorer backgrounds from these developed countries, and you get a subset of ideas from people of the richer background from these countries, so you're not getting the circulation of ideas which you need and which you want to get inspiration across. And I'm just wondering what you think can be done to ensure this is will continue to happen or can start happening. Great, thank you. And uh, the lady back at the back here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephanie Buell. I'm also a student and about to sort of launch my own career in the humanitarian sector. I'm not sure if this is on. Uh, my question is about the external perceptions of the sector. Clearly, everybody who has spoken and probably everybody in this room believes in the humanitarian principles. And although we recognize the flaws in the system, we still choose to live our lives and follow careers that match these principles. And I was wondering how you reckon with some of the intense criticism that comes not just with your career, but with your choice of lifestyle and your choice of what to do, not just as a job, but you know the whole package that comes with a set of beliefs, perhaps uh, coming from an external audience who doesn't quite understand how the system works. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, there's a, another question here also from a student, um, an MA student at SOAS who's listening online. And it's actually also about um, recruiting people. Um, and uh, Emily, the student, says, all of you describe the kind of accidental entry that you experienced at the beginning of your careers. However, Imran also stressed the importance of recruiting good people. Do you think there's a need to increase the more formal entry pathways for graduates as seen in the private sector? For those who, who already know, they want to work in aid and development. So we have two um, questions about recruitment and then one about uh, external perceptions and the criticism that can be directed towards uh, humanitarian workers. Um, Imran, would you like to address this whole issue of recruitment? Um, yes, internships. I mean, uh, we, we recently started to offer internships, and, I, and I, I've, always been, I've always been horrified by the idea of internships. I mean, people working without pay just seems just so unjust. I mean, I, I, I just couldn't fathom it. I, I mean, I asked people to explain to me what, what, what was in it. I mean, I couldn't really... I mean, if somebody's good enough and we, we, there's work to be done, then that's surely a job, isn't it? Um, but having said that, I'm going to contradict myself slightly here. We introduced the uh, process of <laughs> some, about eight internships last year, and we got uh, an MA student from the University of Birmingham and did three months. A guy called Mike did a fantastic job, and we offered him a job at the end of it. And he said, you know, that was the only way that I was going to get an entry-level position in an aid organization. So I, I think there's lots. Of, I think we could do better than internships. I think we can offer something a little bit more like apprenticeships. I mean, it may not be a fantastic salary, but a salary. I mean, it has to be some way of, of, of um, you know, paying an individual for their, their work. Um, but in terms of, you know, the general issue of recruitment, I think we were, again, discussing before the, the uh, you know, the, the, the event that, um, you know, the, there's, there's huge growth. I mean, there's huge undercapacity at the moment. I mean, there's organizations that are struggling to, to keep up with the demands of, of programs. And that's surely a good sign uh, if we can manage that process and, and think 
Uh, and there's a word that we should all be mentioning today, which is innovatively, because well, that's one of the kind of new approaches to humanitarian aid, to think outside the box, to try new things. And I think we've really got to, to, to say, OK, what, what kind of skill sets do we need? We're not necessarily going to have the full remit. I mean, it was very much in the old days a catch-22 situation. It was very much the, the you know, a job for a white, middle-class male, you know, uh, grammar school, perhaps that was pretty much the profile, you know, 25 years ago. And that's changed a lot. I mean, we've got 22 nationalities in, in Birmingham. And Birmingham is a bit off the map, I have to say. It's not like London. But we managed to recruit, you know, from around the world. And, um, and I think, you know, changes in the way that aid is working. We, we, aid is becoming much more localized now. So I think there's good news maybe for those graduates, those MA students that want to enter aid, I think, you know, we, we as organisations need to think more creatively about getting those people in to aid and doing something like, you know, you work three months in the department, you do three months in the field, and then you may perhaps do three months in a comparative department just to get a holistic view of how the whole thing works. These are very possible. And we, because of our crisis in recruitment, we're struggling to recruit because of the issues of expansion, but also we're based in Birmingham, that's not so attractive to some people, and we're Islamic Relief. and. Uh, you know, for some, maybe working for an organisation with an Islamic in it can be a bit of a, a challenge, and maybe that's that's something that they still got to get their heads around. Uh, so we're thinking, so we're having to think creatively, and all these things are now being discussed internally about resolving that issue. Um, but in terms of, can I go back to this thing about communication and, and you know the media thing? Um, I think one of the things that we used to do really well, so sort of 10, 15 years ago, was development education in schools. Uh, and one of the things that you didn't read out was that I was actually head of geography for. I, I took a break from eight, and I was head of geography in, in a couple of London schools. And one of the things that, you know, was, was much more prominent 10, 15 years ago was development education. I think it was the Cla Claire Shaw early years, and there was a big push of funding of development education, a lot more pr publications, a lot more influence and advocacy around the national curriculum. And I remember one day I went for an interview as head of geography, and the school was really quiet. And I remember asking the head teacher, why, why is, you know, is it a field trip or something? And she took her glasses off, and she was very annoyed. She went, actually, half the year 10, 11 are bunked off to go to a Stop the War camp uh, march in Trafalgar Square. And I, and I remember saying, wow, that's a victory for your political literacy. I mean, you guys must be teaching it really well. And she looked at me as if to say, you know, but I've got the job. I don't know how I've got the job. Uh, in other words, I think that's, you know, the media spinning, the, the, you know, the picking on charities, you know, because of excessive, you know, uh, salaries and, you know, charity commission investigations. And ne never the good news. Never the good news that we've actually, you know, managed to channel aid through to those need it, need it uh, in very difficult circumstances. But in terms of how things are changing, I think, you know, again, you know, the localization of aid, the local and national NGOs being really a much more prominent part of the future, that's obviously going to be a major thing. And uh, So we've got lots of things going on. I mean, lots of, you know, contradictory things. I mean, uh, are we going to shrink as agencies in the, in, in the UK? We're talking about shifting the power shifting the decision making and a lot more localization of aid. I mean, local NGOs getting the recognition for the huge amount of work they do and getting more direct funding. Is that going to mean the contraction of NGOs? I mean, uh, in other words, are you entering the right business? Uh, many messages say yes, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a time of growth. And there's some contradictory messages, which is, you know, NGOs in, in the West are going to have to contract if they're really sincere about shifting the power to local and national NGOs. So there's loads of things going on. So you may join the agency, but end up working abroad somewhere you may end up working for a local NGO that's, that's it, from Darfur, mm. and they may be recruiting internationally. Mm. I mean, that's maybe the way it's changing. Th thanks very much. Uh, Katie, did you want to say anything about um, the whole issue of recruitment mm. and also in terms of uh, the way that outsiders see humanitarians and sometimes it can be with a very critical eye? Yeah, yeah. Well... Yeah, in terms of the recruitment, it, we do have this, we have a situation where there's huge numbers of young people coming through who are interested in a career, which is great and fantastic. Uh, and then we suddenly have, you know, the, the triangle is very that shaped. So after five years, you'll find that there are suddenly really not enough people who are still interested <coughs> in, or who, who are prepared to just keep going, particularly I mean, from my experience of, of leading a big department in in the UK of a big organisation, um, I would always say your job, your entry level job is not here. You might get a job here, and that's great, but actually your entry level job has to be out there somewhere. 
and that's up to you to find. Um, and, and that's where aid work is done, not sitting in an office in London or any other capital. And I, I think this is one of the ways in which the perception has understandably shifted. So now there's a, there's a perception that aid is a career ladder like any other, and that one can kind of enter and then just climb the ladder. And I think that's not very healthy, to be honest. I think uh, actually it is really an extraordinary career. In fact, in many ways, it's not a career at all because there are lots of us who, who go all over the... It's not a ladder, it's a jungle gym you know, because <laughs> you are all over the place. You're up the organisation, down again, overseas, in headquarters, the here and there. So um, those that come in expecting that corporate ladder get often quite disappointed. And five years later, as I say, there's a far fewer people who have that kind of experience that we desperately need in uh, aid. And um, uh, so think carefully about what your ambitions are, what your um, priorities are. And by all means, you know, this is a, it's a great line of work to do, um, but it isn't quite like a lot of other things. And, and the other thing, as you say, about public perception, I think there's a huge piece of work to be done, and I'd like very much to call on the colleagues here who are professional in this, in terms of um, how we, as a humanitarian aid business, profile ourselves to the public. Because I don't think we really know how we go about doing that, or even want to. Because some of the time we want to be uh, those sort of on a pedestal, holier than thou, moral high ground type do-gooders who, who should just be kind of patted on the head and, oh yes, they're, they're lovely, they're such saints, they do great you know, stuff and we need to be nice to them. Um, and some of the time we want to be taken a lot more seriously. We want to have political clout. We want to have, um, you know, a, a say in the way that, you know, things are going. Um, and a lot of the time, as has been said already, our leaders want us to become growth organizations which are mainly focused on um, not profit, but certainly um, growth and very commercial type um, ambitions and goals. So we're not really sure where our goals are. Um, and so we're therefore not very sure. And then we're surprised that the public comes back and says, well, you know, for the, some of the time we think you're lovely because you come across as lovely, but then some of the time you actually come across as being corrupt or too cor corporate because you pay your people too much or this or that. And of course they're going to be critical because uh, of those different images that we seem to be projecting at different times. So where we go, I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not saying I've got the perfect answer for how this should be, but I do think that it would be worth quite a lot of thought as we go into a period when there's a huge call on our services, there are massive needs, but there's also an environment that we're not used to dealing with, which is the, the, the sort of flat level playing field of communication where everybody can say everything and hear everything more or less automatically. And, and we really do need to, to engage with that a lot more cleverly. So I'd like to be part of that discussion, I think. Th thanks very much. And we, we're going to run out of oh. time. Would you, do I you just want to add to something quickly, quickly yeah. well, both on the media and the... And the um, the entry points, if you want, or you know, yeah. the formal pathway for graduates. I completely agree with Imran that you know, if you look at how things are shifting, we're looking at how, in a way, you know, a young graduate from here may end up working for a local or a regional organization somewhere else. But nonetheless, and if you, if we, if we think about the formal, you know, sort of um, university preparation, you know, for graduates who want to work in the aid world, until very, very recently, the focus has predominantly been on development studies. Yes, we have had courses over the last 20 or 30 years, but by and large, they've been focused both at undergraduate level and postgraduate level on development studies and not on humanitarian studies. The learning in our field has really not been systematized or mm -hmm. not really become an academic um, part of, you know, an academic curriculum. This is a very recent phenomenon. We're starting to see some MAs fo focus on humanitarian affairs, you know, focusing on um, 
one aspect or another of a humanitarian response. And, and I do hope that that will also help people to be better prepared for their first job, because I think we do get a lot of people that come from all sorts of you know, different <laughs> kind of um, backgrounds, but not really prepared for what it means to be a humanitarian aid worker. I mean, I have come across throughout my career, you know, and, and more and more actually frontline workers who have absolutely no understanding of international humanitarian law or humanitarian principles. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is, part, is because of their you know, academic background, but it's also you know, the negligence of the organizations that send them in, you know, front line in a conflict without you know, being equipped with what is essential for us to understand if we are you know, dealing in negotiating with belligerents. Uh, but that's just one aspect amongst many. So I really do hope that as we work and, and, and we are here you know, with more and more universities to make sure that that becomes a deeper part of the curriculum, more specific you know, part of you know, what they're teaching and we've also you know, embarked on a whole project on the global history of humanitarian action to make sure that we also have a shared, collected, you know, sort of, if you want, documented history that will help you know, future graduates to, to be better equipped when they start, wherever they may start, whether it is a UK-based NGO or a, or a you know, local-based NGO. By the way, I do still think the UK or you know, Western-based NGOs will have a role to play, just a different role. Mm. They will have to rethink how they actually become you know, the partners in, and, and the agents of change in the North you know, to make sure that we still maintain this shared humanity alive also in this country. <laughs> but that's part of another conversation. And on the media, I think you actually have a really big job to do to um, help you know the aid sector humanitarian aid sector in this uh, uh, transition at the moment I, I think I, I always see this pendulum swing you know between aid bashing particularly after the disasters you know they say you're not here with there with everything well I'm here with the camera how come you're not here yeah um, and on the other hand, you have the the problem of you know those who are embedded with NGOs and go out and you know do big reports, but ultimately you know they sort of coloured or channeled by one particular organi organisation that takes you there. Now, I, obviously, there is less resources also for media to do you know proper investigative journalism or documenting you know what organisations do on the ground, and I appreciate the challenge. But I think it would be very useful to have you know sort of more analytical, deeper pieces that really. Um, help the public understand how challenging it is you know to operate in these environments and yes you know th there is definitely the corporatization element in the headquarters in more and more organizations but there is a lot of incredibly dedicated selfless very committed people that work in incredible circumstances in the field whose job is essential for so many people that suffer you know in crises that we can even you know remotely relate to Thank you, and I know that uh, yeah. you also wanted to say something, yeah, so instead of more questions, this will be the, the yeah, last point, I'm afraid. I think I'm the afraid. perception, I agree with you, that the perception is, is really challenging for all the humanitarian sector. But also from national staff, I just want to give you from national staff, if, especially if you are from a country that oppressive regime like myself and others, A, the first accusation to you, you are an spy. Us, we are an spy. Secondly, you are creating a, a dependency syndrome. And, and thirdly, you are actually working for an organization which is part of the setup of the new colonialism. And then fourth, you are corrupted because your, your economic situation changed. So as a national staff, they pass up, up uh, they are under that pressure in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, that. Here, I feel that the way we have done a, a good, but we need to do more. For example, as a result of Operation Lifeline Sudan, which used to be one of the biggest uh, organizations, and as a result of the Rwanda genocide, they came the, uh, uh, the Code of Conduct, the NGO Code of Conduct. And, and, and that Code of Conduct, which came from IFRC, ICRC, I think that's very important to have changed the standards and let the people to, to be governed against, against certain, certain standards. West Africa, the issue about the sexual um, exploitation of uh, the recipients of aid, People, the organization at the beginning, they do this investigation internally. But when they come publicly, actually you diffuse that. So we will help those people to account. And we will not allow those people to get into the organization. And the standards is increasing. I feel that the best thing to approach this is to be um, upfront about the problems. When you face a problem, you do not need to uh, hide it. You do not need to discuss it only internally. Be upfront about it and say, this has happened from our staff member. We terminated his, uh, that, but at the same time, we put these policies so that this will not happen again. If you are communicating that, 
The other thing I mentioned is about the, the dependency. It's about linking the... Re I still strongly uh, feel that we as a humanitarians, we need to see any intervention has to be fit in the longer term picture. And that is, you cannot do it through commercialization. That is where my point, and you cannot do it through commercialization of aid and, um, and, 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 and uh, militarization of aid. Though I say that in the Ebola, I really salute them. They did very well in the West Africa in terms of, of the Ebola. But in the others, they, don't, they, they can't do it. So those, those are interpreted. But I think uh, the character assassination for the national staff is more than the character assassination for the, for the international staff in terms of reputation. But we need to be living the standards, and we need to go to be governed by our consciousness more than the regulations and, and so on and so forth. Thank you very, very much. And thank you uh, to the audience. And sorry we couldn't uh, come to all of you for your questions, either here or online. There are more questions uh, on this iPad here as well that sadly we've run out of time for. Um, in a week or so, there'll be a video recording of this event available. And uh, please, uh, if you have time afterwards, you can uh, gather outside and uh, have some refreshments and speak to the panelists. And for those of you who want to go to the service at Westminster Abbey, you need to be there at 4.40. And so some of you can go from here. And also, um, after the service, there's going to be a wreath laying at the um, Innocent Victims Memorial near the Abbey. And that is taking place at 6. So for those who don't necessarily want to go to the service but want to go to this non-denominational event, it will be at 6 o'clock. And um, please join me in thanking this wonderful panel for uh, sharing all their thoughts.